Good morning. Is it good morning, good afternoon? It's almost in between. Anyways, um, my name is Hope Azeda. For those of you we met yesterday, you know why my name is Hope. Who, who, whom did we meet yesterday? Okay, for those who are not with me yesterday in anything, or lunch or anywhere, my name Hope was given to me by my father, who was very creative. So he had 11 children. I am the 10th born, the only artist. The rest are scientists. They're like most of you. They talk about things that <laughs> sound like rocket science to me. But I exist in this big family. So I was born and raised as a refugee. And kids who were born at that time were given names like mine. Were given names that refugees never had. They were named hope, peace, faith, joy, Give me one more word, the refugees denied. Charity, fortunate, come on, people. Opportunity, lucky, happiness. These were the names that my fellow kids had. And we felt like that, but because our parents were protecting us. My other second name, which I found to be a shield later, does not exist in anywhere in African names, not even in my own language. It is called Azeda. Azeda, my dad, created it because he was trying to hide people that we are refugees. Because if he gave me a name that came from Rwanda, people would know I'm a Rwandese. And he had told his kids we are not refugees. So I grew up thinking I'm a Ugandan. But later when I grew up, people started saying, you, you are Rwandese, go back home. I'm like, what? This is my home. Then I asked my father, why are we not home? Home which was Rwanda. So my name, Azed, comes from the alphabet, X, Y, Z. So for a long time, my name was Hope Z, as just Z. <laughs> because he thought I was going to be the last born, but he got a little boy after me, and he added A. <laughs> <laughs> so it became, so it was like, I started, I finished, from alpha to, um, so like, like I'm done. Hope, this is my, I'm done with 11 kids. So that's why my name is Az. <laughs> so Hope Az, that is my life. So my whole life is just, who I've been. So you can imagine for a long time I was dreaming to go back to a home called Rwanda because it, they used to say the God of Rwanda used to sleep, used to stay outside Rwanda and you come back to sleep in Rwanda. So I wanted to see this country in the world where God sleeps. It was called the, like the land of milk and honey, the land of a thousand hills, a masterpiece of God's plan. This is what Rwanda looks like. For those of you who have been to Rwanda, I'm not lying. Hmm? <laughs> But when I went back to Rwanda, what I thought would be home became a school. I was hit by what had happened in this country. Being born and raised in Uganda, I was raised more in a situation where we were doing a lot of political theater because it was under the dictatorial regime of Idi Amin Dada. So we wrote a lot of political theater. So I was always looking forward as an artist to go back to this country and I, I, love, I write love comedies something happy, something nice. But when I went back, I hit a backdrop of a history where one million people were killed in 100 days. And up to this day, I've never understood how this all happened. But it's what it is. So in 2014, uh, no, 10 years after the Rwandan genocide, I was approached to, to write a piece about the commemoration of the Rwandan genocide. Then I asked them, how much time did I have to write this piece? They said, two weeks. I'm like, two weeks? Usually it takes six months. They said, we don't have time. We're just starting this. We, we want to stop commemorating the genocide in the way we do around the fire. We want a performance. Then I asked them, what is this performance going to take place? They said, in a soccer field. I'm like, what? A stadium hmm? where people play football. Then I asked them, how many people are going to come? And they said, 30,000. I was used to spaces like this, where I would just create works for 400 people. Now I have to create works for 30,000 people. And we only had two weeks to do it. And we are going to talk about the Rwandan genocide, but what were we going to talk about it? There are no words that express and explain this tragedy. So we did the research in the church, in the church where the massacre had taken place. And we discovered a woman who told us her testimony. Now she's hid for four days while she was pregnant. And after four days, she hid in dead bodies 
after they had bombarded the church. She was pregnant. I had people talk about pregnant women in hospitals. We had also pregnant women hiding in corpses. Hiding, but after four days, she gave birth to a boy. And this boy was always with his mother, narrating how, she was bo how he was born. Then I asked myself, what does this boy ask? What, what kind of questions does this boy have for the world? What happened on that day? And after this day, I don't think there's an answer for this boy. So anyway, fast forward, because I have 12 minutes, but I came here to just like plant a seed of change and run back to Rwanda, 16 hours flight. So, <laughs> yeah, planting a seed, you only need two seconds, and then you can go, business done. So, we had two weeks to do this, so I had to look for a way to do it. So we started dealing with memory and hope. Now hope comes back again. Not my name, the word hope. Hmm? So I was like, why does this word keep coming in my life? Yet it's my name. So with the producers, we, we said we are going to talk about this story looking at the eyes of a child born 10 years after the Rwanda genocide and go into his head with his questions. So we did a performance. The smallest cast I think I've ever worked with was 12 people, but this time we had to work with 1,000 people. That's fine, you can cheat in a stadium. Stadium, stadium theatre, you can play with mass displays and poetry. But the most, I didn't know that I was going to encounter the most terrific trauma experience in my life. Working with the musicians, and you reach a point where 200 musicians are all broken, and no one is ready to sing because they are broken and crying. Every little bit of something sparked trauma. People started screaming, it was like a fire caught up a house. So as a director who had come from Uganda for coming back to my country to do some theater, it became so difficult for me to even stand straight like this and give orders. That's when I started becoming a human being and I forget about my roles as a director, writer, blah, 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 those other things. So in this space of rehearsal, because of this emotional breakdown, I found myself seated in a corner crying with the cast. And we had no time to cry, but we had to cry. Remember, I have two weeks to do a show. And you could not tell them, come on, guys, hurry up, cry fast. We have a show, you know. You, you just leave it. You just let it happen. But that became our writing methodology. That in any case, at this point, in this piece of drama, in the stadium, 30,000 people are going to break down. How are you going to handle that? Shall we say the truth or shall we not? If we don't say the truth, who is going to say the truth? So it became very challenging for us. We said if we are the witness bearers, we were going to hold the flag so that the truth could be told. Because right now as I speak, there are people who deny that the genocide ever happened. So we are dealing with the genocide deniers because they want to repeat the same evil. But we are here as witness bearers to make it never happen, to even hear, because it can happen anywhere. Genocide is a global ideology. It's not a random business. It's not a black man fighting a black man, no. It's an ideology written and well scripted that can be cut and pasted in anywhere around the world. So it's important for us to teach ourselves as human beings how do we detect the traces or signs of this evil so it may not happen to you. Because I'm here to stand here to say it happened to me, and it's not a good place to go to. So anyway, the show came, it was announced. I was fighting with the directors and the producers because they wanted to name the show Africa's Hope. I'm like, no, 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 it was sound, I was sound like a dictator. Hmm? <laughs> You're not going to do a piece called Africa's Hope, directed by Hope, and a lot of the songs around Hope. <laughs> you know. That's not professional, they said Hope. There is the, the word Hope. Hmm? <laughs> you, you see? How our names can also become our, 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 our cast spells. So the show was announced, and out of nowhere, rain fell. Two minutes, but it was a natural curtain open. Because you cannot separate rain and genocide. It happened in Rwanda in April, and right now it's raining heavily. But rain is also a good sign. It was time for roadblocks to clear for people to escape. So rain fell for two minutes and stopped, and 1,000 people just went into the stadium, rolled in the grass, and, the, and it was just all natural, soaked in all this. 
But there was also a very, very, very difficult moment for me at that time. There was massive trauma. Because every little move, every little thing, every little action that people did triggered memories in the stadium. And when you, you hear one scream from this side, in a minute you hear another one there, and you hear another one there, and the Red Cross was running around to take and help people. But remember we had said we are going to say the truth. But this was also another starting, uh, there was also a journey of healing that was starting that we are just, also myself, I was just learning how to do this. So it happened, we did a show 100 minutes. One of the testimonies we performed in that stadium was for a woman called Beata, but I didn't know who she was. She came to me and said, thanks for working in my spirit. This is also another strange compliment. I don't know whether it's a compliment, I don't know whatever it is, because we are used to, that was a massive, nice performance. That was, now somebody says, thank you for working in my spirit. I'm like, you, what do you do? So we just hugged. That's all. Because I could not say, I'm happy I walked in your spirit. You can't say that. So you are every, every day you're on a constant journey to discover what this means. Anyway, so five years ago, I started a festival at the Genocide Memorial to help other artists come and visit Rwanda. At the Genocide Memorial, you have 250,000 bodies buried there. And I decided there's an amphitheater, it's a 2,000 seater. So I decided to do this festival there and everybody was like, are you crazy? Why do you want to take us back to sad things? I'm like, if you don't go back there, that stuff will repeat. They said, if you want to do a festival, take it in a, there are many other spaces. I'm like, that is the reason I'm not going there, because everybody goes there. We need to draw people back here. We need to go back on the same page. How do we bring back humanity? How do we question what hate can do to a human being when it buys a seat in your heart? When, ha when hate is enthroned, being cruel becomes the norm. So this festival, I make sure that we, we, we curate the themes and conversations we want. So this year's conversation is this kind of conversation. So I'm just going to play a little scissor reel to show you what this, theme, uh, this year's theme is about. It happens, these things. Hmm? We will wait. Hmm? That is not part of my 12 minutes. Hmm? What if the walls we live with were built on illusions? What if the walls you built for others today became your own downfall tomorrow? What if you were the voice of reason that could burst barricades of confusion? What if you were the glorious light that could crumble the walls of darkness? What if your own children became victims of the burning walls of hate, the burning walls of prejudice you built? What if you were brave? What if you were trapped in the walls of fear built by self? What if these broken parts, this history, the wounded walls became your strength? What if beyond these walls sleeps despair? And you, you lay your life before death to cross the waters. What if beyond these walls live voices of survival, voices of hope? What if in you sleeps the hero that would conquer your shattered dreams? And what if these walls deprived you of all that is good? Goodness that is warm and rainy days. Leadership, virtuous, did these walls black out the light? The light that you could give your neighbor? What happened to turning the other cheek? This farce is a fallacy used to turn you against your brothers, against your sisters. The truth you hear is not the truth. Is it a partial truth, an alternative truth? We've only heard one side of the story, a west side story. But what's your story? What's our story? Our story is our story. Our story is our truth. What if these walls built are a force 
of a false world that encases us as it destroys our humanity. Why July? Because the genocide happened in 100 days. And our morning starts in April on the 7th up to the second uh, week of July. What happens to a human being? I would love to read for you a short excerpt from one of my favorite books written by a British journalist, Fago Keen. Below the village of Rusumu, the river Kagela flows into a steep ravine that forms the natural border between Tanzania and Rwanda. As it sweeps down from the highlands, it gathers into its current huge clumps of elephant grass and numerous small trees. They are then swept and tossed across the Rusumu Falls. In the spring of 1994, it was the same with the human corpses. They too rose and dropped, twisted and turned and came bouncing over the Sumo Falls. The genocide of the Tutsis had been progressing at a fearsome rate for more than a month. By the time it would finish, up one million people have been dead. Consider the mathematics of this horror. One million people in 100 days. I leaned over the bridge and noticed that two bodies had been lodged in the rocks and the side of the gorge. One was that of a man, and the other was that of a baby, between six and 12 months old. I could see that the child had been hacked by a machete, a gash across its skull. I stopped back from the river. I did not want to see that again, and on the journey north to Kigali, where the war still raged, I kept asking myself the same question. What kind of man would kill a baby? What kind of man would kill a baby? I think myself yet again. What kind of man would kill a baby? A man not born to hate, but one, ha one who has learned how to hate. A man like you, or a man like me. No child is born evil, they learn to hate. So somewhere down the line, someone feeds them with prejudice, and that someone is an adult. I must be listened to. I must be seen. Witnessed. Acknowledged. Felt. Reveled. Loved. If it happened before, it can happen again. To forget is to erase. How do we erase a loss so profound when it happened to you? You begin to walk differently. You speak differently. Your thoughts become crowded in fear. Genocide is likely to occur again. Learning about it is the first step to understanding it. Understanding it is the first step to responding. Responding is essential to save lives. Otherwise, never again will remain again and again, again and again. Run and play, my child. Follow your faith. Fear not to stumble. You are born to fly. Free your spirit. Float above. Be and let be. Breathe the life of life. Bygones are bygones. Run and play. Stamp and fall. Roll and fall. Stand and breathe. Run. 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 Because in every horror, there's beauty if there's a will to look for it. Thank you.